And there is a theory, actually, that when you're sort of 14, 15, whatever you're into at that Maybe. period, it kind of bakes in and it really locks in and becomes a whole part of you through the rest of your life. And for me, that would have been Simon Bisley's ABC Warriors. It would have been Aliens, the movie Aliens that came out. Mm. When I saw that when I was 14. Um, yeah. Top Gun. <laughs> Robocop. Oh my Robocop, God. Robocop, yeah. Robocop. You know, that, that, that was brilliant. whole thing for me, Total Recall, it was a bit late mm. in 91, but just that, that whole period, um, that's me now. Predator. Yeah. Die Hard. It's all baked in now. That's me now. You know, that's my... When I think of some... When I think of what is good, that's where my brain cuts, you know. Attention all citizens of the future. Buckle up and step into our time tunnel of imagination to join us on an extraordinary journey into the days of futures past. We'll unearth those tantalizing portrayals of the future and beyond that captured imaginations in their time. Join me as we embark on exploring those futures we were promised, but which never arrived. So let's go to our guide, that excavator of the eventual, that historian of the hereafter, that recorder of retro futures, Theo Priestley. Hello and welcome to another episode of Days of Futures Past, where I get to talk sci-fi geekery and future predictions from the past to the future now uh, with a special guest. And with me, I have Gavin Rothery. Now, Gavin, you have an absolutely gigantic bio, and I'm not going to butcher it too much, but <laughs> um, I have to say Gavin is a, a writer, a director, a producer, an illustrator, a comic book artist, graphic design, visual effects, he worked on Moon, he pr he wrote and directed his own movie Archive, and he's also worked in Star Citizen, which is one of my favourite um, science fiction uh, space sim games as well. So, Gavin, welcome to the podcast. Hi, thanks for, thanks for having me. Yeah, so how's things at the moment? Because you must be extremely busy with this, that kind of, you know, breadth of experience. Yeah. I'm one of those people who just kind of works all the time. So I've got a very understanding wife, very comfortable office and, you know, just getting on with it, basically. Um, it's a bit spacey at the moment because we've just come back from a uh, holiday in Australia. So I just had the, my wife's Australia, has got in-laws out there. So I've just come back and so I'm, I'm just starting to get over jet lag now. So, and if you see any bits of my skin kind of gently flaking off and sort of wafting away in the air, that's just my uh, Australian sunburn going on. <laughs> Now, the, on the track of of um, filmmaking, and I'm just going to throw a bit of a curveball here. Um, is you know what? How do you see the the world of filmmaking? You know, whether it's writing, whether it's directing, whether it's production. You know, being different in the next sort of t ten to twenty years time. You know, because you're steeped in it and you're seeing things evolve all the time. And now we've got the SAG AFRA strikes as well about generative AI. I mean, do you see that? We're going to have to li live with that as as artists, or uh, is is are things going to change spectacularly um, in a different directions? What I'll say, this is a really complicated question with quite a lot of moving parts. Mm. <clears throat> One thing I would say is that where we are right now is not a stable platform to discuss where the future is going to go because we've been in change for the last ten years, maybe definitely the last five years. Um, and what I mean by that, if you look at the entertainment industry, meaning films, television, specifically, um, games roll into this too, but specifically film, TV, um, we're still pinned in as a whole to think about the way things used to be rather than where things are now. I mean, particularly since COVID and the rapid ascension of the streaming services, um, we're in strange times already where we're seeing strange things happen. For example... Um, some stuff going on in the news recently where um, Discovery did a deal with Sony. Sony had a bunch of stuff in their online library um, that was Discovery shows that they'd licensed. People had bought them, had them in their library that they paid for, like we owned them. And the deal was renegotiated with Discovery. Discovery took the license away from Sony and all that content was deleted from Sony's library. 
which meant if you'd bought copies of any of this stuff, uh, it, you woke up one morning to a message from Sony saying, sorry, that's gone. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Bye. And a lot of people were rightly um, rightly upset about that because as far as they, was, they were concerned, they'd bought this media and it was just gone. And we're starting to see this stuff happen. And this, this kind of stuff happens generatively anyway. We've already been through some movies that were made on 35mm for the cinema that never made it to VHS. Yeah. And we had a bunch of movies that never made it to DVD, a bunch of movies never made it to streaming. Like every, you know, every step, there's a, a generation of lost media. Some of it probably should be lost and probably should stay lost, but okay. a lot of it moves. So if you take that as a, um, a possible way forward, it's like things just disappearing. Like nobody, some people talked about this, but I think generally consumers didn't have it on the radar at all or they wouldn't have bought things. Personally, the only online platform I use for regular purchasing is Steam, the games network. Um, Everything else, I never buy things digitally, including games. Because mm-hmm. um, I'm like a lifelong gamer, so things like you know, I'm, I'm buying a game for my kid on Nintendo Switch. Always get a physical version, just so that she can play that for the rest of her life. You know, she's got that cartridge. You know, if you buy, um, it can be anything. You know, you buy Monster Hunter on uh, get a physical copy. That's great. It's like one of her favorite games at the moment. Buy a digital version. At some point. That's going to disappear from the service. At some point, that switch is going to become faulty and stop working. It's gone. Mm-hmm. So I think people thinking towards preservation of media um, is something that's becoming more prevalent. I've always been a, phys- a big physical media guy. I've got boxes of DVDs and Blu-rays. I'm a little bit of a hoarder too when it comes to things like that. So I've got my own library of stuff. I'm sure a lot of a lot of people listening have too, but it's the only way to make sure that you have access to that medium in the future. But that's more from a personal perspective. From a business perspective, it's completely different because everything's been changing. You know, we've got the growth of the streaming services of like killed the studios, COVID kind of killed the cinemas. Um, everybody's cutting back. Everybody, all these businesses became overinflated during the lockdowns. And now they're all just trying to kill the headcount because mm-hmm. um, their expenditures are too high. So everybody's looking to cost save. We've got crazy things going on with the strikes. We've got all kinds of like it seems like there's lots of creative problems going on with these places too. Like for example, with um, uh, David Zaslow at, at Warner's, um, you know, he commented during the writer's strike that they were saving money by not putting out any project because every title they release was costing them hundreds of millions. I mean, how crazy is that? That it's in that it's in a movie studio's interest. The the people leading the studio are commenting publicly that it's in their interest to not release movies. Yeah. It's cheaper. I mean, that's nuts. Um, so I think one of the big problems that we've got to deal with is, well, as a filmmaker, your big problem you've got to deal with is how you mount a production, right? Everybody's got ideas. A lot of people write scripts. There's loads of people out there that would love to make movies that could probably make very good movies that have got a lot of, a lot of things being channeled in their head. And it's like, how do you do that? And... I could talk about that all day, about what I did, what I've seen other people do. Some things work, some things don't. Some things are common among everybody. Some things are like unique to your own path. But one of the things that is always going to get in your way if you're trying to do anything at scale is money, access to resource. And AI can change that. Now, whether it can change it for the better or whether it can change it in any real meaningful way, still up for discussion, all kinds of ethical things going on with AI, all kinds mm-hmm. of like legal things going on with it. You know, the way that all it's really doing is like scraping data and remixing things from other people, all of that. It's almost not AI. I mean, I'm saying that, obviously the developers of AI would have something to say about that comment, but what I mean by that is it can't work in isolation. It has to scrape data to be able to do mm-hmm. anything. But it's almost like if you compare it to a human artist, a human artist would have a sketchbook and a pen and they could create something. The AI needs to go through all of this stuff before it can do anything. So those, they're not the same. Like Those two things are not the same. Um, one of the things about AI, obviously, is that you can't uninvent these things. Like These things exist. These tools exist. Mm. You can't uninvent them. So we have to come to terms with it and deal with it one way or another because it's not going away. <clears throat> I mean, there's always going to be a group of people trying to legislate it out of existence. Um, those things just generally, historically, don't go that well. So I don't think you count on that. I mean, you know, as an artist myself, you know, I 
I can see both sides of the fence. I could be somebody who could be complaining about it, saying, oh, my heart's getting scraped too, oh, blah, 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 blah. But at the same time, like I say, you can't uninvent these things. Um, I tend to spend quite a bit of time playing with these things just to try and understand what they are, but there's no real way for me to integrate these things into my workflow. Mm. Um, apart from one way, which is actually incredibly useful, which I will just mention quickly, um, which is in the, in, the, in the film production space, when you're putting a project together, you tend to have to come up with like a, a they would generally refer to it as a deck. Um, it's usually a um, collection of images that you're using to give you an idea of what project might be. If you're a big project and you've got loads of money, hire a bunch of concept artists, create a portfolio of work, that becomes your deck. You read your script, look at your concept artwork, there you go. Wonderful. Excuse me. Now that's an ideal situation for a filmmaker to be in. What normally happens, especially on the lower end, is people dredge the internet, grab a bunch of images that they think are similar to the kind of thing that they'll want, and that becomes their deck. Mm. So I've spoken to artists like people that I know where, you know, they're, they're always using like images from Moon in the deck to pitch the movie, right? Now that's my work, but I totally get it. It's like, I don't begrudge them that. It's like, you do what you got to do. If you want to hire me on a project, give me a buzz, but just whatever, good luck. I'll watch your film if it's good. Um, so in a sense, that's got some kind of parity with AI scraping images, I guess. But what I've found is that um, tools like Midjourney are actually very useful for very quickly creating like a, a deck of like mood images, mm -hmm. which aren't other people's work. They can be bespoke things. I can do bits and pieces of work to feed into things and use it to finish them to some degree. If things need to be done very quickly, which sometimes they do in the film space, you might have a quick connection, um, comes up, meeting comes up quickly, it'd be very useful to have a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and you can just blast things out. Um, never as good as doing it all yourself, obviously, and having mm. a nice portfolio. But when it comes to doing decks or movie pictures, the AI stuff, I personally think is preferable to just using images from other people's movies. Yeah, I mean, I've... Uh... Myself, when I've been doing sort of bits and pieces of pieces research, research, I found it actually like a, a really interesting research assistant to try and pull bits of um, uh, data or paragraphs or things like that of, uh, from reports so I can then sort of digest it and then make my own conclusions out of it. Uh, I wouldn't use one to <laughs> write an entire report or something else like that, but I think it's useful for bits and pieces. Um, but it's actually really interesting what you say about going back to our previous point on um, physical media, um, because I'm, I've got a great book hoarder myself. Um, I used to have DVDs and CDs. I gave them all up, and then with each successive, oh, I, know, I, know, I know, I know, I know, I know. Yeah, with each successive like format, I went from like VHS to DVD to Blu-ray, and then to to digital. And now I actually want to go backwards. And it's funny, the only two DVDs I still own are actually the um, uh, theatrical releases of uh, Star Wars, Empire Strikes Back, and uh, Return of the Jedi, all pre-George Lucas fettling with his digital wand. Nice. Um, so I've kept those. But I was talking with another guest about um, how... New new generations or the next uh, the generations that are coming up are actually going backwards as well and actually d discovering or rediscovering in a way physical media. So vinyl's never gone away, but now I think it's Gen Alpha um, or Gen Z are actually discovering CDs and are actually buying up CDs by the you know because it's it's still digital but it's also physical as well. And I think there's this kind of um, renaissance in terms of tangible assets i think this is coming back and it yeah. speaks to that point about the deletion of movies and games as well especially because um game the the the, the shop in the, the uk um is no longer taking trade-ins physical trade-ins anymore yeah it's all that yeah um so you obviously growing up in the 70s um, you you were obviously heavily influenced by the you know the media the science fiction the visions of the future at that time, you know what what kind of stuck with you growing up at that point? Well, yeah, I mean the eighties was mainly my my upbringing, so I was in that nice period of the future always seemed very bright to me. It's mm. like I was growing up in Yorkshire in the late seventies nineteen eighties, 
And it was just very grey, very cold, the moors. Like, it's got its own beauty, but just very a very wintry, cold place, right? Lots of... Lots of like aggressive weather, like on the on the colder side of things. Um, you know, very windy, big storms, lots of fog, all kinds of all the kind of weird Victorian stuff when you think about it. And so my kind of parity as a child, as far as imagination went, was that was my reality. That was where I lived. And then I'm watching movies, I'm watching things like uh, movies like E. T. or like Gremlins, these kind of movies. And they're all depicting that kind of 90, uh, sorry, 80s like American dream. Mm. All these kids have got awesome big houses. Look at E.T., right? When I was a kid, my childhood growing up in Yorkshire and Elliot, his childhood in the movie E.T., right? It, it pulls apart, right? You know, he's got this massive Dungeons and Dragons table in his, you know, in his kitchen. They had those cool telephones with like about four meter long cables <laughs> where you could just walk around the room with the curly cable. In the UK, all our cables were like, you know, about 18 inches long and you're like down by the telephone they have yeah. huge cables you know these little things like the you notice these things like they mattered and so uh, but those films were always seemed very bright like there's always lots of sunlight always always just very kind of bright and nice and very kind of aesthetically appealing like the kind of place you go on holiday even like gremlins like opening as a like a, a winter movie covered in snow it's still very bright and kind mm. of appealing and yorkshire is like a very great place so the sci-fi that I grew up with of that period particularly, like the Star, the Star Wars films were obviously huge, but things like Back to the Future, uh, even things like Big Trouble in Little China, like these kind of other movies that kind of slotted around all of that, they always seem very bright and very kind of um, nice. And so I always kind of associated the future with being very colourful and bright. And that also kind of was reflected in a strange way where my dad worked on oil tankers, and so he'd be he'd do like, four or five months at home, four or five months off shipping around the world on oil tankers. And so he'd travel a lot, be away a lot, and he'd read a lot. And so he always came back with like a whole book full of, a whole bag full of uh, paperback and he'd just shove them on a, a bookshelf uh, in the house. And I used to love this bookshelf, even as a tiny little kid, because all these books, yeah, he must have had like you know, a couple of hundred paperbacks, easy. And I used to just love looking at the covers because they were mm. all, like now, yeah, I know yeah. that they were illustrated by people like, you know, Peter Elson and Chris Foss and all these like greats that were doing those illustrations back then. But at the time, you know, as a kid, like three, four years old, I can remember just holding these books and just looking at these wonderful paintings and just thinking like, who are these people? Where are they going? Look at that cool car that gets right around in. Wow, look at his spaceship. You know, just these cover images. They were so rich and bright and vibrant and so full of like possibility they did did i realize now i'm kind of doing this stuff myself there's a whole thing going on with movies where i always think a good movie has curiosity beyond the edges of the frame star wars movies were great for this like you can be looking at the Mos Eisley cantina and you, you know that if the camera goes like that there's something equally amazing over there and over there and behind you and it all feels very real and and interesting as a world and I re appreciate now that these book covers used to do that to me. I'd look at the image, and this would be like looking through a little window, and I could never see the rest of it. But you can imagine it. You can imagine these places and these characters and these vehicles. Vehicles were a big part of it, right? And um, yeah, I, it, it, it just really stayed with me. It just felt very bright and optimistic. It's like you can't have a personal robot. You can't have a hover car. Like these things, mm. they just felt like a, almost like a given at some point. Like... Of course, like if technology keeps going, we will be able to go to space. If technology keeps going, you know, we will, you know, it's the, I have a friend who's just got back from space, a good friend of mine, Trev Beatty, he went on the Virgin Galactic Flight 4. Right. I have a mate who's an astronaut. Like, that's a real thing. Like it happened. Yeah. You know, we went out and did quite a bit of drinking over that one. It was a, it was a good day. <laughs> but do you know what I mean? Like. When I was a little kid in Yorkshire, if someone had said to me, hey, one of your mates is going to go into space and get come back with astronaut wings and tell you this story about zero G and seeing the planet, I'd be like, totally happened a couple of months ago. So, you know, the, the, it's, I think it's easy to look around when you think about the future and just think, oh, this is all just the same old stuff all around us every day. Like, it's mm -hmm. not. Like, things are changing. Like, all around. In every industry too, I mean, you can look at things like the war in Ukraine and you can look at the way that weapons have been changing. You can look at all these incredible weapons that are being used out there. It's really cool. 
And you can look at things like the way that they're using drones, like mm. consumer tech in new ways to create new weapons. And it's like, that's a whole other thing. That's evolving faster than anyone could have imagined. Like, it, there's all kinds of weird stuff going on. Like, things like the, um, you know, the CRISPR technology or in medicine. I mean, yeah. one of the things that really interests me is the medical imaging technology. I always found that wonderful. Like, the way, I mean, just starting with x-rays and where you can see inside a body without opening it up. I mean, wow. Like, that's sci-fi. And now you look at some of the medical, image, med medical imaging equipment that's out there, and it's just fantastic, like how this stuff works. It's amazing. And so I've always been very interested in what may be invented in the future as far as medical technology goes. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can't even imagine it. And one of the things that always gets me is usually... Um, and the entertainment industry is good for giving us some kind of a window on the future because if you look at the the sort of nuts and bolts of what happens, you've got all these like authors, um, creators, writers, all kinds of people creating media, like artists creating imagery, and they're trying to predict the future. And a lot of the time, they're trying to like put things into it. Like when you're doing a piece, like when I'm designing the ship for Sars, is it? You know, you're trying to think, like, how would this actually be? Like, how would it work? How would this ship be manufactured? And what might be different about it than you might expect because of some kind of an advanced engineering or something? Um, and we spend a lot of time and energy working on those things on Star Citizen. And again, Moon and Archives, all the same stuff. Like, I could tell you all about those locations, um, like with the Moon base on Moon, like the way the doors were the way they were. It was a whole engineering system where the door, this is just stuff I made up that you don't, it's not a part of the movie, but the idea is the door is always trying to close and it's held back by a system. Right. And so if that system, if any if the electricity fails, the door slams shut by itself. You don't need power to close the door. You know, and that makes sense in a, a situation where saving a door could be the, closing a door could, you know, create um an at save an atmosphere or lose an atmosphere and be a difference mm. between life and death. So those kind of things, like you're always thinking about those things. And um I'm going off point now. Where was I? Where was I going with this? Sorry, I'm swerving all over the place here. No, no, it's a really interesting conversation, actually. I, I do actually enjoy the the meandering aspect of it. <laughs> Sorry. Don't no, 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 it's about. fine. It's fine. We originally started talking about, um, you know, you growing up and it was very grey. And then we had Chris Foss and Peter Elson and Sid Mead. And, you know, I, one of the, the projects that I worked on personally was oh, I got to talk with um, Sid Mead before he died. Um, wow. And Chris Foss as well um, over the phone about, about the project and about the design of the sort of things I wanted to see and a lot of it was to do with the colourful aspect of spaceships and, and the fact that everything that you see these days is very sort of grey, white um, uh, whereas Chris Foss and Peter Elson had weird and wonderful designs that were probably completely impractical and, and Chris Foss obviously used, um, you know, fish as an example for a lot of his designs, he always looked like angel fish or something like that, giant angel fish very colourful as well and it fascinated me um, you know, in terms of design, but also the use of color in an environment that is stripped of it, um, and how that and how people would respond to that, um, and I think those kind of sort of details matter in science fiction, and especially when trying to dream up uh, different worlds. Um, and I totally get your point about filmmakers um, inventing or, or almost trying to envisage what the future would look like, and using the details that you described because. I find the same thing happened back in the 50s and the 60s when we didn't actually understand the limitations of what the technologies were. So we had atomic-powered cars and nuclear trains and jetpacks. And, oh, read Adimo's foundation books. They've got yeah. like atomic ashtrays. Describe a guy flicking a cigarette stub and it being vaporized in an atomic-powered <laughs> ashtray. I mean, it's great, but you know, we obviously you're not going to do it now, but um, I, I think... It goes back to that that bright and optimistic kind of sort of future when we were kids. It was unconstrained imagination, and I think filmmaking helps with that in terms of dreaming up worlds. But at the same time, you, do do you find that, that you know you get a lot of critics going, "Oh well, you know this would never happen in the real world because physics and and chemistry and and electronics and and stuff like that." And, no, and I just get... wonder if we're poo-pooing a lot of the imagination oh, out of. Who cares? Like, look, 
at the end of the day, if you get comments like that, I actually take that as a good sign, right? Because if you get those kind of comments, it means you're reaching more people. And if you reach a lot of people, you invariably will start to get some negative comments and this, that, and mm. the other. You'll get somebody who'll be like, this is the worst thing I've ever seen. I hate it. Go away and die in a corner. And you'll be like, you know, that's actually good. Like, obviously, it's like pretty, pretty, you know, nasty thing to write. But we all live on the internet, right? If you reach a lot of people, you will start to get some people saying stuff like that. As long as it's like, you know, a fraction of a percentage of people saying that and not like it half, really... I think you're okay. If you get to approaching half, I think you might actually have a bit of introspection to do. But if it's just that odd little flicker now and again in a comment, I think that's a really good sign because it means you're reaching so many people that the odds are coming into play and these kind of things are starting to happen. So yeah. I think that those kind of things are just a good sign that you're actually doing well and reaching people. Um, weirdly. I mean, obviously, you've got to put it in a box. One of the funny things about criticism, though, is when, like, you know, I learned this really quickly when Moon came out because we were out at Sundance when it launched, Sundance 2009. I was out there with Duncan and uh, um, Gary Shaw, the DOP, and my friend Baz, who was like the editor. We're out there, and... The did the premiere, I went along, seemed really fun. And then the next morning, the write-ups come out, and we were all just, I remember being, we stayed in a Winnebago in Park City RV. Parks are hotels cost a fortune. So we got a Winnebago, rented it in Vegas, drove to Park City, and just camped out in the, in the uh, RV park. Uh, it was really fun, a lot cheaper than a hotel. And um, yeah, I read the reviews, and they were all being really nice to us. And I remember thinking, like, this is awesome, but this could change at any point. I don't know these people. Like, this, I, you know, you, you can't get too into it because if somebody says something nice about something you've done and you're like, yeah, I knew it, I knew it was awesome, that also means when somebody tells you they thought it was trash, that really affects you. Like, oh, my God, it's trash, it's trash. I knew it was trash. And it's like, at the end of the day, I do my own work to a place where I can defend it. I know why I made the decisions I made. If somebody wants to talk about it, I can explain my thought process throughout the work, why I did what I did, why I didn't do some things, why I did do others. And beyond that, it's an opinion, right? You might like mm. it, you might not. I'll tell you why I made the decisions I did, and generally that it works out fine. But beyond that, you know, you can't really go with praise or the um, occasional bit of negativity that you get. You just can't. Can't get you can't go with it. I always think of it like um your moods can swing really quickly if you get into mm. this stuff too much. And I always what I found with Moon, I was like, okay, I can't I can't get too buoyed up by this because I you know, I started to get really sort of jubilant and euphoric going, Yes, it worked. People like the movie, yes. I remember thinking like this is bad because this up feeling could very quickly become a down feeling if I do the wrong thing in the future for mm. whatever reason. And so I learned to kind of moderate my um, feelings towards it and take more of a inner glow that just persists a lot longer. And I much prefer to live like that now. It's funny, it took me a couple of weeks to kind of figure that one out and get control of it, but I'm glad I did. So Archive then, going from Moon to Archive, which was your own project, um, and I'm really interested in, in how you approach the whole... I guess the the AI and the robotics side, but just the the ethical and the philosophical questions around that. Less about the tech, but more about you know how the robots were and how they uh, you know uh, treated their own environment, I guess, and and became aware of what the who and what they were. Yeah, I mean, I've always loved robots in movies. I mean, one of my original loves was Silent Running, mm. the Doug Trumbull movie. You see, I got Huey, Dewey, Louie on the shelf behind me. Um, yeah. yeah. The my dad showed me that when I was six. He showed me Silent Running, and it, it blew my mind. I mean, I thought they were real. Like I thought those robots were real robots, and it really stayed with me. And when we did Moon, you'll see some vibes of Silent Running and Moon, and it just came out when when because Moon was made like myself and Duncan were living in a flat together. We were just trying to make a film, and Moon was what came of it. So it was really just, Moon was like me and Duncan just living in a flat, pulling our hair out, trying to, like, how do we do this? How do we do this? And we ended up trying to come up with a, a, an isolated 
capsule type environment to tell a story in. Um, you know, that was and same approach with an archive. Um, but I've always loved robots that can make me um, feel sad mm-hmm. somehow. I'm not sure what it is. There's something about something about our little mechanical friend that's really loyal, that's hard done to. Something about that. It's probably like a sci-fi version of watching somebody being mean to a pet or something. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? There's something yeah. there. There's some... So it tickles me somehow. And, it, and I find it very interesting. I find the whole thing about, you know, if you created a machine and gave it something approaching emotions, even if they were simulated, and they didn't respect those, like... You know, how does that play out? Mm. And the other thing, too, is that there's so many tropes around robots in movies, you know, like destroy all humans, you know, sort of, if you don't do right by the robot, it's going to get angry and try and kill you. And I find those, as a starting point, those are really good to bounce off because people sort of kind of expect that a bit, which I think you can lead in with something that looks like it might go that way and then take a bit of a swerve and tell a different story. And I find things like that quite satisfying when they when they're done with the correct attention. We did that with Moon, with Gertie. Like, Gertie was, um, you know, when you first watch Moon, it kind of plays out like Gertie's going to maybe, like, kill him or try and kill him with mm. the robot arms chasing him around and stuff. Didn't do that at all. Gertie was a complete sweetheart and actually, um, actually sacrificed himself for Sam. And with, you know, with Archive, obviously, we've got, um, we've got J2 having her quite tragic character arc. But I just find... The idea of somebody initially thinking that this robot might do harm and then realize that really the robot's probably a lot more um, softer or sweeter than they thought they were. Mm. And doing that kind of 180 whilst the story kind of sort of flows around it and past it, things like that just tickle me. They tickle a part of my brain that I enjoy. Um, Silent Running always makes me cry at the end, but I think that's more to do with Joan Baez singing that song. Um, which always gets me. Um, and uh, when when you were talking about um, robots that um, that kind of they're quite sad, and the immediate one that came to mind is not not Star Wars or anything else like that, but Black Hole and old Bob. It was yeah, like this sort of Bob. beat up robot that was uh, at the mercy of yeah, that was yeah, a robot yeah, bullied, wasn't he? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but uh, the, when I when I read your, what, some of your comments um, on the um, on the sheet, you know, uh, uh, 2000 AD was an, uh, another sort of uh, heavily influenced. And I actually saw one of Pat Mill's tweets the other day, um, tweeting out the, the the original sort of artwork for Mega City One, which looked far more optimistic and bright than the than the horrible dystopia that we see today. And, and then obviously that was depicted in the movies. But the other one that actually um, uh, got my attention was Starblazer, um, because I used to. I used to buy that up like nobody's business. And I have a bit of a treat. And I don't know whether you're going to appreciate this or not, but I have no, this is, an oh. issue oh. one. I have nice. I have a bit, I have pretty much the whole collection actually. Um I've got a full set this, of star blazers. Have you? Yeah. Um but I used to I I thought the stories were great. They were such good reading. And then, of course, you've got the cover art as well, which is fantastic. But interesting story about the cover art. Do you know the background of Starblazer? Um, no, not f- fully. No. You know what I was mentioning? Um, what I mentioned before about the um, novels that I, the artwork I used to love on the novels. Hmm. Is it IPC? The publishers? I think it was IPC. They owned all the rights to that artwork. They just published all these paperbacks, and they had catalogs of artwork. And what they did was they went to comic create and said, use this as a cover, use this as inspiration, make up a comic. And that's what Starblazer is. They were inspired oh. by old paperback um, artworks that was being reused to become the Omega Experiment. Right. Um, actually, I wonder then. So why the covers I've are got, so um, good? Covers are beautiful well, yeah. Starblazer. Well, it reminds me of um, the old analog um issues as well the science fiction um, writers used to write for like asimov and and so on because i've got about 600 of those kicking around in, in the on the bookshelves as well and they've all got the same kind of sort of covers as well i'm just going to tell you a little secret thing okay i don't think i'm going to get in trouble saying this um i was 
this has all gone very cold now, but there's a period where the rights holder to Starblazer coincidentally got in touch with me about something, something else. Mm -hmm. And we got into a chat and I realized that they had the right to Starblazer. And I actually put together a, a pitch for how it could become a Netflix show. And it was, it was nailed. And I knew it was always going to go quiet because Starblazer such a small IP. There's mm. no way that's going to become a hundred million dollar Netflix series. But just saying, that was a particular high. I remember I rang my mum up and I was like, Mum, guess what? She's like, what have you been up to? I was like, Starblazer, Mum, Starblazer. She was like, oh. But I think that would appeal to a certain generation and then obviously introduce collectors, uh, you know, uh, different collectors in a different de generation to go basically seek them out because there's some so of the stories much quality were... in there oh absolutely and, yeah but unfortunately i don't think that's ever going to be come to be but you know if everybody listening does a grassroots campaign that they want the star blazer show maybe i can use that as a bit of, bit of leverage and get back to them i tell you the one that i really wanted um and we tried to get um access to the ip was ulysses 31 well oh. um you know greek what a mythology crazy in show space that, is. that was what great a wasn't crazy it? show Again, um, lots of robots. Yeah, lad, uh, yeah, no, no, wasn't he? He was the yeah. guy, the wee well, the whole red guy. Ship was full of robots, right? Everything that they did was it was kind of like a robot, like robot, like beds and things, and like hover scooters everywhere. There's just loads yeah. of robots. <clears throat> cool. Yeah, unfortunately, I think the last time we spoke a couple of years ago, it was like IP hell because they sold the original creators sold French um, creators sold it on to an American cartoon company, and they've basically held it and done nothing with it for the last 20 odd years oh there's so many one of the big things that's happened to me since my movie career has kind of like got me to the position i'm at now mm. it's just how difficult it is to get hold of ips even if you've got money there are there are so many people that are they're also referred to as right squatters right. they just hold catalogs of ips and they just lock them down maybe do something with it maybe not yeah just can't get hold it's, of it, it is there anything from your childhood then that you kind of wished had come true by now that you'd seen, you know, in a book or a, a TV show at the time? Well, I mean, wished they'd come true, definitely. I always loved the Blake 7 teleportation with the bracelets. Mm. I was pretty obsessed with those. I remember on Blue Peter once they made them as a kid and I had to make teleportation bracelets. I just thought that was such a great story device. Because it wasn't like a superpower, because you had to have the bracelet. And so in the narrative of Blake 7, sometimes they'd lose the bracelets or they'd get taken off them or destroyed and they'd get stuck somewhere. Mm. And uh, it's just so... I just found that so captivating. Oh, I'll tell you one. This isn't really... It is sci-fi, but this is a life goal that I'm going to make through one day. I always wanted one of the moon buggies from Space 1999. You know the right. little yellow six-wheeler... ATVs. Yeah. I thought they, I still think they're super cool. But as a kid, you know, they're super cool in a way that when you're an adult and you might be able to save up some money and find one or find something similar and make it into one, they're very different reality. Yeah. So I do have a goal to have a Space 999 moon buggy. You don't want an eagle, no? I mean, eagles were wonderful. Um, I mean, that was a classic piece of design. Although, there was always something that bugged me about the Eagle. I'm going to... Say with me here. I'm going to... I'm just about to slag off the Eagle Transporter. Um, it's all done with love. It's all done with love because, you know, this is also my job designing shit. Not really anywhere to put fuel. No fuel storage at all. There are those round... Uh, behind the big, the big bell engines, right? They've got like four mm. big bell nozzles. Big nozzles. Behind each one of those, there is a round chamber, which you could argue is for fuel. It's about each one's about half the size of the engine nozzle, and that's it. That's all you've got for fuel on an Eagle Transporter. It's not enough, and it, it does annoy me. Um, this could be fixed by just scaling up the, the Eagle as a whole, largely. Mm. I do have a thing I want to do, and one of the things oh, I shouldn't talk about this because someone else will do it. I want to do an art book where I basically just redesign classic ships, do my own take on them. I've got some stuff knocking about online where I did the Millennium Falcon a while ago, 
Um, I saw that one on your I, website, I never finished actually. it, but, you know, I, I sort of did a bunch of stuff and I was like, it's work in progress. Never finished it. Um, and there's a version of the Liberator that I would love to do. I know what I want to do with mm. that. But there's all kinds of, like, cool ships that I think would be good to have a do-over. But maybe I'll maybe I'll get to do that one day. No. I think the ship from Ulysses will be another good one. Yeah, what was it called? Um... I, I, do you know what? I'm, I'm thinking about it. And, and it's, it's the Odyssey. The Odyssey. The Odyssey, yeah. So who influenced you the most, Dave? Because you've talked about Mead and Foss and everyone else. And um, is there one in particular that, that kind of influenced you the yeah, most and it's not what in you your think. designs? Simon Bisley, that guy in 2000 AD, when he first turned up in the ABC Warriors serialized black hole, what was it Prog four was it four eighty, four sixty, something like that? Um when he when his artwork turned up his black and white line artwork, Simon Bisley in the black hole. Oh my god, I've never seen anything like it. Now when I was a kid I didn't really have art books. So the stuff that really inspired me was two thousand AD mainly. Every mm. week you have a copy of two thousand AD, there'd be four or five different stories drawn by different artists, maybe like eight pages each. Sometimes a different artist on the cover. So every week you'd be getting that exposure to, you know, five, maybe six different artists' work. And some of the artists that they had working for 2018 were unbelievable. People like Cam Kennedy, Carlos Tascara, um God, pick. You've seen 2018, right? Everybody in it yeah. was just wonderful. And people like Mick McMahon. And Brian Bolland and just all these, all these guys, Brett Ewins, like as a kid to be waiting to get that and then go to school and have an art class and just like, you know, I was just drawing comics all the time, like yeah. never seen anything like it. Um, but the real one that really got me was Simon Bisley when he first dropped is I was probably about fourteen or something when that came out. And there is a theory actually that when you're sort of fourteen, fifteen, whatever you're into. At that mm -hmm. period, it kind of bakes in and it really locks in and becomes a whole part of you through the rest of your life. And for me, that would have been Simon Bisley's ABC Warriors. It would have been Aliens, the movie Aliens that came out. Mm. When I saw that when I was 14. Um, yeah. Top Gun. <laughs> Robocop. Oh my Robocop, God. Robocop. Yeah. You know, that, that, that was brilliant. whole thing for me, Total Recall. It was a bit late mm. in 91, but just that that whole period, um, that's me now. Predator. Yeah. Die Hard. It's all baked in now. That's me now. You know, that's my... When I think of some... When I think of what is good, that's where my brain goes, you know? Yeah. What's next for you then? Well, I mean, it's impossible to answer that for sure. I'm working on Star Citizen. I've been on them... Uh, yeah, I've been with them for like nearly 10 years. So Star right. Citizen's my my jam and I work on movie projects around game work. So if you're a player of Star Citizen, stay tuned for ongoing ships from me. There's a bunch in the pipe already that haven't been announced. Um, as far as movies go, I've got five active projects at the moment. Nice. Two of them are finished scripts with production companies. One of them's about to be announced imminently. Uh, there's a It'll be in variety. The variety of writing up at the moment. That's going to be announced shortly. Um, other ones out of cast. I've got another project with a huge production company, which is um, about to start on the script for that. Uh, I can't really say too much about this stuff. You know, if it's not been no, announced, you can just be like, yeah, I'm doing a thing with some people and another thing with some other people. But what I would say is there's loads going on conversations with some of the best people in the business super optimistic and yeah for me personally exactly what i want to be doing so i've got a sci-fi comedy project i've got a sci-fi thriller horror and i've got a sci-fi action movie amongst all of those there's also um i won't say straight up horror because it's not a straight up horror but it's like a horror the horror thriller i guess another way to describe that right. but yeah, things going on all over the place, but can't talk about them. And they might end up becoming nothing, or they might end up becoming huge theatrical blockbusters. 
you just you let's just hope the latter. Yeah. Um, Gavin, I've, I've 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 had a really good time chatting um, about this, especially about yeah, you know some of the childhood influences that you've had in science fiction. Um, have you got any personal websites or portfolios that people can look at? And especially, obviously, plugging the films Moon and Archive as well. Yeah, go get DVDs, everybody. Go get your DVDs <laughs> while it's still available. Um, yeah, we. Uh, my website is www.gavinrosary.com. That's just my name. Um, where are we at now? 19th right now. I don't know when. when's this going to be dropping this, when you're going to be releasing it. Oh, this will be dropped um, a weeks uh, weeks away now, to be honest. Okay, cool. We've got, we've got about 10 or 12 already in pipe. Awesome. So, in that case, I'm talking to you from the past, where my website currently looks like trash, because it's about to be updated. I'm working on it now. So let's just be optimistic, and I'm going to say, a new website's up, and it's going to have... If it's not there yet, it will be having a store. I'm going to be getting into some merch and making some lovely, cool um, apparel. Oh, so hopefully that'll swag. be done. If it's not done. You go and have a look, and it's not there. It'll be coming in the near future, I promise. Because all right, something I've been thinking about for ages, and it's just finally getting to a point where it's called Western. There was one thing I wanted to mention that I forgot. I'm just going to mention quickly, just in case people might want to get into this stuff if they're not already. But this was a whole big thing. Oh, Lego, OG Lego space from the late 70s, that one in particular, Mobile Missile Launcher, oh my god. I've been petitioning LEGO to try and get them to do a do-over of that set. They released right. Galaxy Explorer, Explorer last year as a, a remake of um, classic LEGO Space. Um, LEGO, please, please do Mobile Missile Launcher. Hang on, let me remember how to do this. <laughs> I watch um, K-pop videos. <laughs> Um, we, we actually had a guest who was doing this, and they were filming from their iPhone, and of course the, the whole f the whole screen filled up with their love hearts flying all over the place. So you know, power Aww. of tech. There we go. Um, Gav, thanks very much for being on the show. Absolutely loved it. Um, we will put all the links um, to everything um, uh, in the show notes, and hopefully the merch store will be up and running by the time this podcast goes cool. out. Cool. Also, uh, Twitter or X. Uh, w uh, yeah W W W. Uh, G A V R O V Gavrov must meet at Gavrov. Brilliant. That's it for another episode of Days of Futures Past. Uh, please uh, stop by again when we will uh, discuss uh, more science fiction geekery f uh, futures uh, and past predictions with another guest. Thanks very much. This is Days of Futures Past signing off. When we'll once again peel back the curtain on more lost futures. Stay tuned and remember. The future may be here, but the past never fades. Until next time. Days of Futures Past was brought to you by Theo Priestley, keynote speaker, author, and retrofuturist. If you'd like to appear as a guest and reminisce about futures gone by, get in touch. I've been your radio host, Andrew Helbig. Goodbye for now. <laughs>